Hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Rattlecast for, what is it, Tuesday, March 3rd. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got 10 people watching live and two likes already, which I really appreciate. If you're watching live now, please do click the like button. That always really helps with the algorithms, and, you know, we really want to appear on the, um, you know, up next stuff on YouTube. You know, if you're watching a poetry video, we want the Rattlecast to show up on the watch next. And if you click the like button, that really helps. Um, now, today's guest is uh, Rachel Custer, another excellent show for you lined up, um, and you're going to really enjoy it. But first, we like to do a um, bit of a warm-up poem just to get us started as everybody settles in and finds a comf- comfortable place to sit as they watch the Rattlecast. And um, the poem I wanted to start with was the just-announced winner of the 2020 Neil Postman Award for Metaphor. Um, Craig Van, U- Van Ruyen's poem, uh, Siege Machinery. Now, we started the Neil Postman Award for Metaphor way back in, gosh, what year was that? 2006, maybe? And um, it was really, I'll, I'll say it here, which nobody knows. It's a secret, so don't tell anybody. It's a secret just between you and me. But um, it was the idea of Eric Campbell, a good friend of mine and a great poet, as they say. Um, and he loves Neil Postman, and he um, told me to read... Uh, argument or um, amusing ourselves to death. Neil Postman's book about uh, modern culture from back in the '70s, and one of the things Neil Postman says in there, he has a whole whole section devoted to metaphor, and he says that um, metaphor is an instrument of perception, and um, it talks about how important metaphor is, and really metaphor is what makes poetry so important. It's the way we create new meaning out of the world, and um, so every year we we look at the poems that we published in Rattle, and we find the one that exhibited the best use of metaphor, whether it's extended metaphor or just little great metaphors throughout the poem. We have 14 winners so far, and if you haven't read them all, I really encourage you to go back on our Neil Postman Award page and look at the past winners, because they're all such great poems. And this year, it was Craig Van Ruyen, and I want to share his poem to start out. This is poem, um, Siege Machinery. And um, um, let's see, here it is. Just one second, though. Okay, here's his poem. This is Siege, Siege Machinery. Siege machinery. Dusk slides beneath her dress, creeps across her thighs, slips over the rise of her belly. Night gathers in the hollow at the base of her throat. I know she hears knives sharpening when I unzip her, the dress down fountaining over her bare feet. I can vanish into the dark small of her back, my bristled chin plowing down its single row. But there are places I dare not touch the timpani behind a knee, the bowstring throat, a taut and fluted ankle, each an old crime scene still taped off. Yet she has learned to open, guiding the hot blades of my hands into untouched places that burn with their own furnaces. I don't pretend to be a healer, bring only my glinting hook of need to pedal open her ribs, crack through the gristle of her assembled face. She is a horse, Gravid with the bodies of old lovers. With them, I move inside her, waiting to set the city on fire. That was Craig Van Ruyen reading his poem, Siege Machinery, which was the winner of the 2020 Neil Postman Award for Metaphor. If you would like to submit to the Neil Postman Award for Metaphor, all you have to do is send a submission to Rattle. Um, at any of our free categories, we consider everything for the Neil Postman Award. It is just we look through at everything we published over the last year. Sometimes it's Poets Respond. Sometimes it's the Ekfraxic Challenge. Uh, more often than not, it's the print issue. But we look back at whatever we've published and find the best use of metaphor that we found throughout the whole previous year. And we felt that was Siege Machinery from Craig Van Ruyen. Um, Craig Van Ruyen is a uh, judge in the Superior Court of San Luis Obispo County. 
He has a BA in journalism and a JD from UCLA and an MFA from Pacific University. He was also winner of the 2014 Rattle Poetry Prize. So um, he's one of those poets that we really admire at Rattle, who has a different job that has nothing to do with poetry whatsoever and still as a you know, part-time passion, writes really great poems. He hasn't had a pu- book published yet, and he really needs to because he writes uh, great poems. Um, that's Craig Van Ruyen. You can't find him anywhere on the internet except for um, the few places he's been published. Um, he publishes frequently in Rattle, though, so check out Rattle and look up uh, Craig Van Ruyen. Now, today's poet um, is Rachel Custer. Um, she's appeared in three issues of Rattle and three times in Poets Respond, most famously with How I'm Like Donald Trump, which is, I think, I can't remember, it's like the seventh most read poem um, in Rattle's history. It's the the most read poem from Poets Respond. She's the author of The Temple She Became from Five Vokes Press. She's also the recipient of a 2019 NEA Fellowship in Poetry. Um, she's published poetry all over. She lives in Indiana, and her work is consistent, constantly informed by the wrestles with the values and struggles of the rural Rust Belt. Her Christian faith is vital to her understanding of the world and her art. And um, here she is, Rachel Custer. And don't forget to unmute yourself, Rachel. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. So glad to see you finally. You know, we published you, I still remember the day. It's sort of a a day that lives in infamy or something. Yeah, where I, I remember it too. <laughs> I made a post um, on my own Facebook page, uh, just my personal Facebook account, and said, you know, we've received, it was uh, during, right before the 2016 election. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> and we, um, I made a post and said, you know, we've, we've, I've, I've read, we've published like, you know, I've read 5,000 poems hating on Donald Trump. And, um, and, um, you know, we published maybe like five or 10 of them or something. And I really would right. love to see like one poem that like, su- you know, felt compassion for Donald Trump in some way or something like that. And I remember you left a comment. I had no idea who you were. And you said, <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> and, right, right. And, and I, and I just thought like, well, yeah, whatever. Um, and then it ended up being a great poem. And so we published Thank it you. and then, <laughs> you know, you. stuff happened and whatever, but, um, it's really cool to, um, to see you and um yeah so um and you're in india it is it's good to kind of meet right the meeting the way we meet now it really is yeah um so do you want to start us out with a poem like any poem of your choice i have your your poem just sent me here Uh, on file and one thing i have to say usually i show the book on the document cam but i read your book like a year ago and I lost it. Okay. I don't know where the heck it is. Thank you. So but oh, you I, lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. But I, for the life of me, I can't find it. So uh, so we're going to do the whole thing over document cam. But I'll, I'll show it right now. This is uh, The Temple She Became. Um, okay. and a, a beautiful cover. Um, I can't remember who the artist is. And since I don't have the book, I can't. Fl- Nyoko Fujimoto. Nyoko Fujimoto, Nyoko yeah. Fujimoto. Yeah, beautiful yeah. art. The Temple She Became, she became from Five Oaks Press. Um, it's your book from a couple of years ago, but I think most of the poems you sent are more or newer poems, right? Yes. Yeah. Most of the ones that you've seen probably. So, uh, so start with something, whatever, whatever you want. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to start with a poem called song. Okay. Um, let me find it here. I'm not in order of anything. And this is, I mean, representative of me. Okay, so it's just called Song. Um, Yeah, I'm trying not to explain as much. (laughs) Song. A woman alone in the boat of a man. A woman a moan in the throat of a man. Brief stone afloat in the moat of a man. Secret sewn into the coat of a man. Note a man, how he struts down the road of a girl. How his rough voice cuts the ode of a girl. What she owed, not the world he's made of her fear. Not the shade of him here where she's paid with her tears. In the game, so she thinks as she drinks one more beer. Yes, but think will pay a child. The child. Praise for that child, the one. The knees is a cry for a life where to live will mean more than to die. Goodbye is the bone in the throat of her now, a huge stone sinking the boat of her now. 
While she stands in the bow, child in hand, singing the last mournful note of her now. And that was Rachel Custer uh, okay. reading song, uh, a newer poem. Um, I agree. Um, so, so if you have any questions for Rachel, uh, feel free to leave them in the uh, comment window on Skype. I'm, I'm watching, uh, and I'll pass anything, any comments or questions you have for Rachel along. Um, so, Rachel, one of the things that I that I just find so interesting about you, you, you published a bunch of essays back in, I think, last year, maybe a year and a half ago, um, about poetry and spirituality. And, um, and you mentioned your Christian faith a lot in your, your bios and whatnot. Um, can you talk a little bit about what poetry is to you and, um, and how, it, how it relates to your faith? Because, um, you know, poetry to me is a spiritual act, even though I'm sort of a secular humanist or secular transhumanist or something. Um, I'm losing you. You're losing me? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, you're cutting kind of in and out. Well, your sound is fine for us, so kind of, I don't know. What I want to ask you about is... Um, your relationship between poetry and faith for you. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can't hear you. Hmm. We can hear you fine. Um, you're good. You can hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I just, I keep, you keep cutting out for hmm. me. Do you want to switch your headphones to the other ones you had? Is that, that could be it. Because your, your audio is fine for me. Okay. As long as I can hear you and what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're good. You're good. So just I'm asking about um, the relationship between poetry and faith for you, because I because you wrote a bunch of essays for Ojal okay. that are that are really interesting yeah. to me. So what what do you think about for Ojal? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about poetry and faith? Like, gotcha, how is it? A, yeah, no problem. Um, well, that has that's evolved. That's been an evolving thing for me. Um, but I am a Christian. Um, and I think for me the way that I understand God is primarily, or maybe not primarily, but in a large sense as a creator, right? As a creative God, it's the first thing that we find out about God in scripture. Um, in the beginning, God created is the fifth, it's the fifth word of scripture, right? The first attribute we know about God is that he makes. Um, and of course, our relationship to God is that we are his creation. Um, and so I see, I see God as an artist, right? The first artist. Uh, and what we know about how, from scripture, about how he creates human beings is that he creates us in him, in his image. In the same way that a sculptor, right, makes, you know, it makes the statue of David in his image. Um, and so creative, the expression of creativity as a, as fundamentally, uh, something that we do naturally um, to kind of emulate and interact with um, the God who created us. Mm -hmm. So to me, that um, it's a, it is it's a spiritual practice, right? To create. You were talking about metaphor, and I think, think about um, Christ uh, in the Scripture and the fact that a lot of the way that he the way that he shared spiritual principles was through parables and stories, right? And a lot a lot of the Old Testament is written is poetry um, or Proverbs, you know, the, kind of similar to like the Zen ko uh, koan, is that how you say that? Um, so it, literature um, and metaphor is, I think, is necessary. It's a spiritual practice. It's the only way we can understand something that is beyond, fundamentally beyond our understanding, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I um is to say what it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh yesterday we were talking or I was talking to you and if if you um noticed on the screen if you're watching live, it said Paul E. Nelson underneath Rachel Cousin for a minute because I forgot to update it. But I did the interview with uh, Paul E. Nelson over Skype uh for issue number sixty eight, which is coming up in the summer. And we talked a lot about poetry as a spiritual journey, as a as a sort of prayer, um, and a way to yeah. connect with the the broader nature of reality that we can't really access and that's really what i'm most interested in mm -hmm. um when it comes to poetry and um um i don't know it's just really interesting to me i um i find the the idea of um um 
Christian faith a lot more interesting recently. So, so I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, now, let's see. On the chat window, um, uh, yeah, so Leslie Herbert says, I'm hoping you will read uh, from your Flatback Sally poems. Do you know what, she, what are the Flatback Sally poems? Oh, so this is a new thing. I've been writing a few. Um, so what I've been doing instead of publishing lately, because um, it just seemed so overwhelming to me to think about all the things that needed to be done to share poetry after I write the poetry. Um, and it was getting to a point where it was feeling like a, I was finding a hard time to love writing the poetry. Um, so I've just been kind of sending them out by email. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> um, oh, wow. Because I, I just... Yeah, yeah. I fundamentally dislike the idea of, um, in a way, of commodifying, mm -hmm. but also not commodify. I guess of this this the poetry community that we've created, this online quick turnaround kind of thing. I I, I like some of it. I like engaging in it to some extent, but I also just liked writing poems before I ever knew about mm -hmm. that, right? So I just like to share the poems sometimes. And I think that's, for me, the important, that's one way that I'm trying to get back to just loving writing poetry. So anyway, um, I have this mailing list that I kind of send poems out to. Um, and the Flatback Sally poems are kind of a recent, I started writing some of these kind of Rust Belt narrative voice mm -hmm. poems um, with the before I got the NEA, um, and Flatback Sally is kind of this, I don't know, this woman that I've created and written about and through, and I've written a few of them now, and everybody seems to really like her and like the poem, so. Um, she's a mythologized me, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I guess all, maybe all of our people are, but she's a sinner. Do, do you have any of her, of the Flatback Sally poems um, among what you sent? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, to, let's see. I, I see have, Flatback Sally Dreams of an Escape. Do you want to maybe read that? Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll grab that one. Have it in here somewhere. And then I have The Old Man Warns the Young Man at the Bar. So, um, you want me to go ahead and read Flatback Sally yeah, Dreams yeah, of an Escape? Yeah, Okay. Flatback Sally, Dreams of an Escape. Sally burns like a fever through the night. Listen, she can spin a tall tail just like a knife. Sock it into your chest from 30 yards. Deadly as some silences, that one is. Keep secrets tucked against white thighs. My clip fat with little lies, half-truths. All the world knows of you. Listen, she is purring. Draw me closer. Castle me. I can be just as loyal as royalty. Switch. Mercy runs like nighttime through the fever of a boy. Listen, she will spin a tale. Of good intentions, she knows just enough to be dangerous. Of danger, she knows the pretty house he keeps. Light singing a window hymn. Where Sally goes, Mercy follows. A little girl is a certain light, catching the wrong eye keening through the desert toward promised land. Mercy knows she's not hard enough to cross that final river. Faith, a blade tucked inside her hand. There's Flatback Sally. Do you want to... She's a problem. <laughs> do, do you want to read... You said you had two. Do you want to read the other one? I do, yes. The old man warns the young okay, man yeah, at the bar. Okay. Flatback Sally, come a whole new woman once that sun go down. Run over this little town just like a glance. Careful, young man, she might just fall on you. Be careful how you do. That girl's all mouth and swallows and swears. Hell burnt the bottom of her throat. There's silence well, but that don't mean she hears. Listen, Flatback Sally, got nothing no man needs. Let a woman be your vessel. Sally bleeds for men to stop her spilling. You should know, when girls like Sally bleed, it's all for show. What smile she shows, there's twice that grimace hid. Her porch light eyes like lures. Believe me, kid, Sally may look pretty there beneath you on her back, like moonlight on steel teeth, a new laid trap. Yeah, and that was uh, 
That was the old man warns the young man at the bar. One of the flatback Sally poems. Yes. Um, one of the things you know, we published <laughs> we published you um, in uh, the Rust Belt Poets issue, and one of the things I when one of the essays I think I read yes. maybe Ojal, you said um, you talked about wanting to represent stories from you know different places that that don't usually get represented, and you say small towns are made of stories, and a person might as well be the stories people tell about her. Which I thought was a really interesting um, way to yeah. talk about small towns and stuff. You live in, uh, you grew up in in rural Indiana, right? Um, so, so what yes. are you trying to do in, in, as far as representing um, that culture in in the rural rural middle middle America? I guess you could say. Well, I think that the culture, in a lot of ways, is constantly talked about, right? And um, in ways that gloss over the true, the reality of it, um, and the in ways that kind of dehumanize uh, and kind of distance. And so I'm interested in troubling that narrative, I think, um, always, and in humanizing. And uh, in bridging maybe some of the some of the beliefs that are held with some of the realities, um, but also in mythologizing and in my in my own way and in our own way, you know, um, mm-hmm. troubling it. Yeah, yeah. Complicated. Yeah, troubling narrative. narratives is a really great sort of. I never, you know, heard it put that way before, but um, it's a great um, way to say what poetry does, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a cat now. Yeah. Hello, cat. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I know. My cat's like crazy. Um, I think so, and I hope so, because I think that it's really easy to simplify and dehumanize and distance, especially with social media. You know, it's so easy for us to dehumanize each other and respond to one another as if we're brands, right? Or as if we're accounts or whatever, um, you know, icons. Uh, and I think it's, that's so uninteresting. It's, it's so, it's just not what I want to do with poetry or with words, you know, that you can do with that. You can do with marketing. Yeah. It always seems to me like, um, you know, poetry's job is to expand human consciousness and to sort of make order out of the chaos and the interstices of our lives that we don't fully understand. And so so disrupting narratives is the job of the poet, you know, like you have this map of the world and um, and and yeah. and what poetry really does or what really art does is um, is break apart that old map and say, hey, you're missing like whole things here that you you didn't see clearly. And yeah. um, and I think that's why you know, right. art is such a tough sell. Like you mentioned marketing and, um, you know, art doesn't sell the way, the way, um, commodities within popular culture do. And, um, and it's because, because it's disruptive right. rather than confirming. Um, so, so it's interesting to, to hear you put it that way. Well, I think order out of chaos. Yes. But also chaos mm-hmm. out of order in some ways, right? Um, because if you think about like a glossy magazine, um, they're perfectly ordered, right? Um, they always have the same style, the same, uh, we have even, now we have genres of writing that are like search engine op- optimization, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so that's order, but it's not truth. So in some way, sometimes truth can be like, you know, the, I think you can break that apart and that's where you find truth. Um, and I do, th- I mean, so I don't know. I think you're right there. It has to be something, I don't know, something with a twist, right? Or what is it? I don't, it just seems like more marketing. Yeah, well, well Kate Hanson Foster says that was the best thing about the Trump poem. And uh, that's what I agree completely. It was just something that we hadn't heard. It was a pr- different perspective, um, and and so many people appreciated that uh, because that's what that's what that's what art's job is: is to break up what you think you know and to to just break up um, new ground. Um, do you want to read a couple more? Yeah, I think so. 
Sure. Um, does anybody, has anybody asked for anything uh, specific? No, or? no. So whatever you want to do is totally good. Um, so I want to go, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I'll do um, a poem called Consider the Trigger. Out here. Consider the trigger, the difference between winter and winter without, that deep freezer humming like a beast. What hunger sleeps in your belly, cave? What fear? This end of year is colder than the last, this fast approaching fast, these short days long. We can't afford to eat if killing's wrong. Consider this a warning shot or not. Our children are not trees to take their lives life from light in any way there's almost none this meat our son this lifeblood you disdain this loss of life life our livings gain meat for bones and straining backs double shifts and chopped wood stacks meat for making all we do meat for shipping it to you that was another new poem i think yeah go ahead yes i think I think a lot of what I want to do um, with the more with the newer poems that I'm writing a lot about um, kind of the people here and the narratives that are that I've seen about the people mm -hmm. here where I live um, and where I've lived uh, is to both bridge uh, the difference between them, but also to maybe implicate. I I don't know how to say that implicate people in um in community if that if that makes any sense uh you know i think it's i think it's boring and easy to suggest that there are all these bad people over here or all these x people or y people without considering what is it that you do to com to contribute to perhaps the reasons for their lifestyle, right? The reasons for the way they live. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's something that um, always troubles me. Just the way, like, I hated that deplorables line um, that Hillary Clinton had, uh, and uh, yeah. just writing off a whole segment of the country. Um, I live in a town. It's a small town near a military base, so there are a lot of a lot of military people here, and. Um, yeah. You know, they're the deplorables, really. And I play softball and poker with them. And they're good people yeah. that have good kids and, and care about, you know, they're not they're not racist, sexist, xenophobes, yeah. you know. Um, and so it's really it is it is troubling the way that we yeah. we do that. And, and if they do that, too. You know, like um, liberals or libtards It's a way that we just have these tribes of, um, you know, and, and, and yeah. social media yeah. with its echo chambers and the way we silo each other. Um, it's so easy to paint other people as caricatures that think differently than we do. Yeah. But, uh, but for the most part, we have the same values and, right. um, and, and there's really not a lot of, of exploring yeah. that, that, um, conservative side of, um, of our American culture, uh, through poetry because there are just so few conservative poets. Do you have any idea right. why that is? Like, why are there so few conservative poets? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I have some. There may be more conservative poets than people know, but either they don't talk about the fact that they're conservative or they aren't published. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, there and because a lot of I mean, a lot of po a lot of I'm have a lot of places that won't publish me won't even I mean, <laughs> they've told me they've said it straight out. So it's not that's fine. They you know, that's their magazine or whatever. Um, and that's what they do. That's cool. But, you know, I think that a lot of the issues that we've seen, the struggles, the reason that people were shocked that Donald Trump won is because they were in an echo chamber where they didn't understand that the vast, mostly silent middle of the country doesn't necessarily talk a lot about what they believe or what mm -hmm. they do. Um, they just do it. So they don't necessarily 
or haven't up till now, I think this is changing, um, don't necessarily get on Twitter or get, you know, and uh, they just go and vote Mm -hmm. in droves, in absolute droves. So, and when we're all locked in our echo chambers, you know, it can be very shocking to learn that there are people who think the opposite, the exact opposite of what you think, (laughs) Um, you know, and that's something I think we've all kind of been dealing with. Uh, since the election is it feels almost like there are two worlds Mm -hmm. right um if you try to get outside of that at all um and so and that you're constantly being pushed to one extreme Mm -hmm. or the other um and i think you're right the the majority of us are somewhere there in the middle um want to be (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) well i don't even know if that's the case though it's just the troubling thing to me is that it seems like we just get more and more locked into our one mode of thinking and um and you know like you like you unfriend or like there's trend you know they divorce somebody if they vote for the wrong person or whatever you know i mean that that just you know we have to have dialogue and a bridge for that gap so we can talk to each other um right. do you want to do you want to kick that cat out and, right. and i'll i'll put it on on my screen if you want to get up for a second um well, it's just it's just a little like she keeps walking over the um, walking over the um, microphone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have um, I have a I have a dog. We have a German Shepherd, and um, he comes in. Well, I do the critique of the week all the time, and starts scratching himself and stuff. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just it's just life. Uh, which is a cool thing about um, doing these these shows and showing yeah. uh, poets in their actual environment, like it's not uh, like the AWP conference where everybody. In my <laughs> yeah, these are there's like a, a nature documentary for poets <laughs> every time, but we all have cats and dogs and stuff, and um, it's it's cool yeah. to see. Um, do you want do you want to talk a little I bit? Know. about... Uh, and mine are yeah, crazy. Are they? <laughs> do you want to do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about? Um, the experience of publishing that poem and um, and what happened on social media, like like how did it feel to you? Um, it was it was a very strange experience to me uh, publishing that poem now three years or two and three and a, how many years ago? Yeah, three and a half years ago, um, and it, it has been a while. And um, and I just, I still think it's a great poem. Um, if anybody hasn't read it, it's how I'm like Donald Trump, and it and it really just a great it, it could have won the neil postman award for metaphor it was one actually it was in the running uh, it's a great extended metaphor for trump is the grand canyon what? the um the biggest empty space to be filled i think it's just like just a great way to um characterize that sort of aspect of humanity uh it got beat out i think by kelly grace thomas last week's uh guest it was i think it was like among the two poems uh, we were considering actually oh. and she just like ripped off the metaphors and and you had That's one really extended cool. metaphor. So it's kind of like, yeah, I remember <laughs> contemplating that. But, uh, but what was the experience like? Because it was really strange for me. Because um, the first, like, six hours after we published that poem, I got a, a huge response of people who really appreciated it. And, um, you know, because we'd, we'd sort of had Trump, I always call it the two minutes hate, where, you know, it's, it's like 1984, where we just stare at the... Um, the Trump figure is someone to detest and, you know, and he's detested in a lot of ways. So, um, right. but then, but then to, to have that turned around and have him be viewed through a lens of empathy to sort of what he goes through psychologically, I guess you could say. Um, a lot of people really wrote in and said they appreciated the poem so much and it was great to have fresh poems. And that was like the first eight hours. And then, um, and then, um, I don't know, after it, it sort of hit social media or hit Twitter and so then all of a sudden I started getting all this hate mail about how, you know, yeah. I should be hung from a tree and, you know, and fired and, and you should die and everybody should die because everybody should always die. That's kind of how it felt for uh, for the next 12 hours after the first eight. Um, and that was my experience. But what was that experience like for you? And do you regret it all? Like, do you because um, I think that was right. I don't know if it was before if you had like issues before on Twitter or if that was the start of it. But uh, do you regret yeah. publishing that poem is another, another question I've always wondered. No, I don't regret it. I'd do it again tomorrow. Um, I think that, first of all, people who kill art are contemptuous. I have no respect for them. And I, I mean, you know, because of what I believe about what art is and what our creativity is and what our creative process is, I just don't. I don't care. I just don't 
think of them as moral or ethical in any way. Um, <laughs> I have strong feelings about that. Um, I will say, though, there was uh, previous to the Donald Trump, you know, I was fairly new to the to both being online and especially the online poetry community. Um, I had started an AW find a uh, the bind uh, poetry group. Hey, right? uh, um, hey, cut out for a little bit. Can you and, can you set back? You started at AWP, and then we cut out a little bit. Okay. I had, I had gotten, I had been, I was brand new kind of to the poetry scene or whatever, um, and had written for a long time, but never knew that there was like a poet, like living poets that wrote. Um, and so uh, at the AWP mentor, um, the mentor to mentor program, and uh, joined as part of that, or from downstream from that, I learned about uh, the Binders Poetry Group. Mm -hmm. Um, and that and that's binders full of women poets, which, which I th I th for people who don't know, um, just for the background, yeah. that's a group. I think I think yeah. Mitt Romney uh, um, said back in two thousand, what was it, two thousand twelve, um, when he was running against um, Obama. Yeah, he said that he had binders full of women, or something, something. like that. And so so um, you know, it, as a yeah. response. Um, women, a really, really wonderful thing. Uh, women got together and um, started networking through these binders. And one of them, you know, there are all sorts of different kinds of um, careers and jobs and stuff. But but people started networking through many things. And one of them was poetry. Th so yeah. there's this binder full of women women poets. So that's the, the background to this. Yeah. it's It could have been a wonderful thing. Um, and I'm sure for many people it was. It was extremely horrible for me um it first of all uh the binders group was predicated on a world view that was entirely inconsistent with the world view that i had ever held mm -hmm. um a lot of the stuff the way that they talk the lingo and stuff i'd never really I mean, I'd read crit, like literary critical theory and all that, but um, it was like critical church, right? Like, um, and uh, I transgressed. So I, I mean, fundamentally, I did not because we fundamentally held different world views. Um, people thought the worst of me, uh, and I just kind of rolled downhill from there so that started um and yes i do think there were real positives for a lot of women with those groups the negative thing was that then um they become a very powerful place from which to kill people's work um and i think there have been men that have experienced that and there have been women that have experienced that i think the the deep deep irony is that the people who seem to have it experienced it the most is the people who to whom they claim to be allies mm -hmm. Right. So people who are already in these groups that they claim are marginalized, um, they're the ones who get mm -hmm. harmed. Right. And then the white, maybe the white men kind of fail up. I mean, you know, um, not to join in that thing, but really, I mean, they go on and they publish with whatever and whoever. And then and yet there are people of color or there are, you know, gay people or whatever that are working class. And they just kind of who knows, maybe they stop mm -hmm. writing. Maybe that's why they don't have any conservative poets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... So I think, I mean, that's real. That's a real mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I feel like it's, um, it's a little little cultish, to be honest. And, um, you know, it seems like the, you know, if you're, if you're in a cult, like if you yeah. think, think about like Scientology, and we'll probably get like attacked for just talking about Scientology. Yeah. But, um, but if you imagine Scientology, like they go after more than anybody... They go after people who used to be Scientologists and then sort of have transgressed in some way, yes. because that's a way it's not really a way to yes. change the culture. It's a way to keep people in line within the cult and to, to be feared of being right. apostate, right. you know, and um, so so going after somebody who's in the yes. binders and, and it's not just yeah. you, you know, I've heard 
from from so many people that um, that the binders is a really toxic uh, place, you know, for anybody who deviates yeah. whatsoever from the party line, and it's just a way to enforce groupthink. It seems to me. Um, how how is yeah. how is? Oh yeah. Well, you have to to even join it. You have to. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, um, how has, um, you know, you mentioned th that now you publish uh, directly just by emailing people and don't really participate as much in um, the literary community. Um, how is that? I don't know. How does that feel? Like, how is that? What's that been like for the last, I don't know, year or so? Um, hard in some ways. And, um, disappointing in some others, but also in a way kind of freeing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think that um, I kind of did not, I mean, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I was having personally that happened that just made things really bad. Um, and then I just kind of engaged and and kind of sent things over the cliff you know mm -hmm. what i mean um there were a lot of personal my daughter was sick and you know i was drinking a lot so um it was there was a lot of stuff that i it ways that i engaged that i didn't necessarily know any better of how to i don't know how to handle it mm -hmm. but with that and and so now i think it's very, very difficult. It was very difficult for a while for me to find, almost find the love I had for poetry mm -hmm. again. Um, with Just with the toxicity of the environment in general. And so because that toxicity, I think, is rooted a lot in the online community, right? And just got off of it. Um, I just let it go. And I think that was important. It was freeing for me to just say... I just want to share my work. I just want to write mm -hmm. poems and give share poems and read poems and you know. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't want to be published in all the cool mags and you know have all the cool people retweeting my poems and reading my poems and saying how great they are. But is that real anyway? Mm -hmm. The real thing is where someone reads your line alone in a room somewhere and it means something to them that they never knew before, or, you know, connects you to them or that's what I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of thankful in a way. And no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything about that, about the Trump poem. I think it was important to write it. I think that I almost think that sometimes when you need to write a poem, you almost have, it's kind of almost received almost kind of channel in a way, not channeled in the spirit, but you know, almost like a received wisdom or a shared larger thing than just you or your thoughts. Um, and that poem, I, it, I really felt like it was, I wrote it in about 20 mm -hmm. minutes. So it just came. Do you have that poem like in front of you? Uh, I can get yeah, it. Do you, do you want to read it just because we've talked about it oh, for like so much that we probably should read it. So people know what we're talking about. Um, if you, if you don't mind pulling it up. Yes, I will find it. Yeah, yeah. So this was published in um, yeah, yeah October like twenty sixth maybe of two thousand sixteen, right before the election, um, and uh, yeah, this was after we'd published. We yeah, published. The, I mean, the hate I got from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the hate I got too. Um, it yeah, it really was. It was sort of just just unhinged, frankly, like as if publishing a poem that um, that sort it, of tries to was, tries yeah. to imagine, you know having empathy for Donald Trump as, um, as somehow that was going to swing the election, like a poem could swing the election. Somebody said, are you, after he won, somebody wrote me an email and said, are you happy now that you got elect Trump elected by publishing that disgusting wow. poem? Um, so let's hear that disgusting poem because I think people probably want <laughs> so, to listen to it. Well, and so the reason I brought up the binders in the first place was because then of course, when that thing comes out, when you see all these outrage groups coming out, it's already been talked about and ginned up in that group, right? Or in groups like it, where it's like, oh, did you guys see this problematic person or this problematic journal or whatever? That's always the word they use. Then they go off on a big 
huge like hate fest and then they hit twitter and facebook and it looks very much like you have a mob Mm -hmm. who all these people think this thing right except they've already been thinking this thing together behind the scenes so anyway yeah, i'm always reminded of this um, is called how i am like i'm always reminded of there was um in a fourth grade I, i grew up in upstate new york and there was this story that my fourth grade history yeah. teacher talked about, about how when the British were going to come up the Hudson River to invade New York, there was an island and there was like there were six troops or something stationed on this island. And to um, to make um, the British ship that was coming up think that there was a whole tr- bunch of troops there. He had the general of these like little little brigade of like six or eight people had them walk just in a row in and out of the yeah. tree line over and over again to make it look like it was a yeah. huge army. And that's kind of how this stuff on Twitter goes. It's like the same, right, they, circle they back do, it's around, the same right? like 50 yes. people and they make it feel like it's, you know, 5,000 or something, but it's 50 people who are just, you know, have a yeah. certain worldview that, you know, and, and they, they genuinely believe their yeah. worldview, but um, it's a very closed minded, one dimensional worldview pretty much. So um, anyway, let's hear the poem, How Am I Like Donald Trump? And I think I can put it up on screen too. Okay. How I am like Donald Trump for DT and other lonely people. Yesterday, I said the thing I was trying to say perfectly to myself. I am something astounding. I am like the Grand Canyon, I said, by which I meant I sometimes feel hedged in by those who would sweat in hot cars for days just to stand and look at me. And people think I am saying I am a spectacle, a wonder, surrounded by nothing as huge as me. And people think I am claiming majesty. People travel for days to look at the most important canyon, which is to say the biggest empty space. Sometimes I might as well kick pea gravel over the side rather than try to explain who I am and wait until I hear it hit the ground. What I am trying to say in small, hard words that always fall away from what I mean is I am not the canyon, the immense perfection of its depth. I am more the missing earth dispersed, trying to feel whole, to believe that God makes sometimes by taking away. Yeah, and that's so How I'm Like, how I'm like Donald Trump by Rachel Custer from uh, October 18th, 2016, right before the election. And the poem to me, I don't know what it means to you, because, you know, really, when you tap into something sort of deep, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But but to me, it's, it's a poem about narcissism and that empty like it, like we published a bunch of poems that were critical of Trump. Right. But really what it is, is an extended metaphor that really explains the problem with narcissism. Like there's this empty space that, that desperately needs to be filled. And um, it's a it's a hollowness. And, yeah. um, and and of all the sort of like think pieces yeah. and opinion pieces of the New York Times and whatever about Trump's sort of issues that he has, this poem, more than anything, um, illuminated the, 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 you know, him as a human being who struggles with something uh, which we all struggle with it maybe as a result of, but um, who struggles with something serious and is a real human being with uh, with the flaws and and like the rest of us. So I don't know what the poem means to you, though. So I, I'm, I'm curious kind of to what what you were thinking about when you wrote it. Well, it was, um, one thing that I've seen, I guess that I've seen from through all of this is I've realized how my worldview shapes the way that I see things in ways that I don't necessarily know is different from the way other people see things. Um, because of probably the same, you know, the echo chambers that I have set up um, just by nature of living here. And, you know, so um, there's an idea in my faith uh, in Christianity called original sin. And the idea is that um, we are all, at least in the Christianity, as I understand it, is that we are all inherently sinful and inherently unable to be holy, right? Holy enough to be, to earn our way to God. Um, We need grace. We need redemption. Um, And so how, 
when I wanted to be empathic, when I wanted to try to write a poem, and that was the challenge kind of was to write a poem that wasn't, I was seeing all these poems come across that were just like, you know, bludgeoning on them again and again and again. And I, I get that people can, that's valid to write about, but I wanted to try something different. Uh, I thought, you know, what about all these people? There are millions of people who think he's quite, you know, he's a valid candidate. He's not all these things. Um, and so I just thought it is not that far of a leap from thinking, from understanding that we are all inherently sinfully lost and saying, I am like this person who is horrible in some way. Right. And so I just thought, how am I like him? And in that way, I can be, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> and I, I felt at the time I very much empathized with this whole the the main visual that I got of him, which was angry crowds surrounding what looked like just a lonely mm-hmm. man yeah. to me in a lot of ways. So, you know, um, and I felt that way. I felt alone and I felt um, sad and empty. And I, you know, at my worst, I'm sure that I can be narcissistic and angry and mm-hmm. hateful. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah that it's, was the, it. the epigram is for Donald Trump and other lonely people, and um, and it really fits because uh, I think that kind of yeah. fundamentally is what I mean, that's what narcissism is is um, you know not having a sense of being loved and so having that hole yeah. that can never be filled. And I think that's what I mean. That's an armchair um, shrink. Trump or any anybody that I've never, you know, um, analyzed directly. But uh, but that's kind of it feels like that's what it is, is a sense of, of loneliness like that, that can never be never be filled. Um, and but but it's interesting that you right. talk about original sin, because I've always felt like even as an atheist, uh, you know, I think the one thing that we're missing the most in society, maybe, you know, after um, God is dead, and we don't really have religion as the fundamental sort of center of society anymore. We really don't. Uh, but what we really miss the most is the concept of original sin, because the idea that everybody is flawed and struggling and fails um, constantly, you know, is such an important, uh, an important central thing right. to realize, you know, and, and you can't have forgiveness without that realization yeah. that everybody's flawed and everybody has problems and we're all right. doing our best in the way, you know, with the cards right. we've been given. Um, and I don't know. I just think that's such an important. There, there are a whole bunch of concepts that I feel like we're, we're lost and missing from Christianity. And that's one of the main ones. Well, yeah. And I think that that's the problem. The if we want to talk about the woke world view, right? This is the problem with the world view that I confronted in with the binders or with the on Twitter or whatever. The world view that um, that says do better, right? Mm-hmm. Do better. Uh, the understanding, and, that, and that's, that's why I think that's what notion in that world view. You're either in or you're a monster, right? It's a black and white thing you're either okay or you're problematic because it is rooted in a belief that people can fundamentally be good right so so when i say that the worldview that i hold is absolutely diametrically opposed to everything that poetry is right now um or that maybe human the humanist idea of um that people are fundamentally good or can ever be fundamentally good Um, it's as opposed as it can be. And I would make the case that that exactly what you said, you can only have redemption if you recognize that you're a sinner, right? I don't know how any poet can see the history of literature and not realize that we are all broken, right? (laughs) We're Mm -hmm. all fun. So I don't know of any perfect poet or writer that I've ever read. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the problem is, I guess I would say I have, oh dear, are you oh, there yeah, still? No, I'm good. You're good. Okay. Sorry. I lost you somehow. No, you're good though. You're fine. Okay. So I guess I, I would, okay. 
I don't know. I'm missing you. That's okay. I, I hear you fine. I see you. So just keep going. Okay, sorry. So I guess what I would say is that I, I had a little bit of a jump start on that whole idea of being able to identify with someone who was had the that some was monstrous in some people's eyes mm -hmm. right because i have the capability to be a person who needs redemption mm -hmm. like we all do yeah. i think yeah um, i think so another thing that that i think you said at some point um that i really felt found interesting again as a um secular sort of evolutionary biology atheist kind of person um you talk about that the social mobbing as a manifestation of Satan. And I actually completely agree without yeah. having the religious background or cosmology to back that up. But, what, but my opinion of it yeah. is that um, that mobbing behavior is the um, sort of neurological construct or the neurological program that Satan was built to represent which was this sense of, of intense tribalism and hatred of the outgroup and, and the way that we, um, um, you know, just stoning people, like stoning people is Satan, you know? And, um, and right. so, so right. social media, like Twitter behavior, where everybody piles on and um, it's the dissolution of self toward the, um, a destructive othering, I guess. And I really feel like that is the... Is yeah. the human trait which came through uh, biology? You know, you know, for two hundred thousand years, humans were in a small tribe of maybe one hundred and fifty or two hundred people. And if you saw somebody who wasn't in your tribe, they were a deadly, like existential threat to you and your tribe, right? And right. so any other was this this right. sort of you know evil that you needed to to destroy before they destroyed mm -hmm. you. And I think that was the history of the human race. And, and so we have this like programming in there to see the other, to see the deplorables as somebody who, you know, we need to pile on and destroy. And I feel like that is the um, sort of the, I don't know, like the, the, the evolutionary technology or something that um, Christianity created was this concept of Satan as a construct to represent that tendency in human behavior. And so when you, so so and you've said that that Twitter mobbing feels like Satan to you so evil yeah right? evil like that's what it feels like um, I think that's what evil is 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 yeah. intentionally trying to destroy the outgroup uh, and e even if you're you know claiming yeah. to be inclusive um, trying to destroy the outgroup is like the heart of what evil really is and um, yeah so can you say anything yeah. about what your feelings about that are Well I think. Um... You know, it makes me think of like the 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 part in the Bible where the woman is getting ready to be stoned for adultery, right? The man is nowhere to be seen, of course, um, but they're going to stone the woman. And Jesus says famously, right, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So what you lose when you lose the concept that none of us are without sin is that everybody is perfectly willing to start throwing stones. Um, and so I think also the other thing about social media is that it tricks us into um, into thinking that we are only saying our opinion or our one our, we are one voice right um, and then but when you're on the other side of it and you have a thousand people right or even 50 as you said um, making a comment it feels very much like you like an existential threat to mm -hmm. you Right. And then so then in some ways you respond in a way that's out of fear, right? Yeah, out of almost yeah. that that abject fear of being backed in. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you're, yeah, you're kind, of, kind of cutting out a little bit. So I'll talk over you for a second um, and hopefully it'll come back. But um, okay. but yeah, I feel like it's um, it triggers this uh, reflex, which is like drowning. I think it's like a drowning mm -hmm. type reflex. Where, yeah. you know, being cast out of the tribe when Absolutely. we were hunter gatherers on the savannah for 150,000, 200,000 years, being cast out of the tribe was a death sentence. So what this social media does is hijack that right. neurological circuit and, and it makes you desperate mm -hmm. to um, fit back in with the tribe. 
And so you're saying like, please don't kill me. Like, and, and that's the, the sense, right. you know, the emotional, sociological right. sense that we're right. experiencing when you're mobbed. Um, and, you know, and both you and I are people who've gone through it. Right. And um, it is really hell. Like, it's not fun at all. Like, you can pretend that you don't yeah. care. Uh, yeah, you can it's pretend horrible. you don't care. Yeah. And that, that it really hurts, it hurts. bad. It you know? hurts, yeah. And uh, that's just the truth of it. And, uh, and it changes you forever, I think. Um, for me, uh, yeah. it's... It does, yeah. yeah it's terrifying. Yeah. And it, it's really, um, you know, like Don Cher is gone from Twitter. Uh, you know, everybody's sort of backing away and it creates this sort of sense of just dread, I think. Um, and it's really unproductive and, and not, yeah, and, and not a, um, and not participating in poetry in the way that's positive and, you know, transcendent that, that we should be. Uh, so, so that's what it is. So we've been, well, I don't think you can. It creates a an environment in which it's impossible because to trouble the narrative, you have to be willing to tell the hard truth, right? You have to be willing to say the truth about what you see in the world or in yourself even that's horrifying, right? The monstrous that you see within yourself or the world or even, even just the daily, the kind of banality of evil, right? And right now, everyone is so busy trying to stay on the right side of the mob that we don't we mm -hmm. we're not saying anything interesting unless i mean unless you're someone who kind of has reached a level of being kind of unimpeachable and i'm not sure that there are as many people there mm -hmm. as think they are yeah yeah <laughs> well i mean everybody has original sin i think oh. that's just the truth of human nature um, now we've talked about this subject. Like I, I kind of wanted to put like a little bit of this talk at the end to not trample your poetry. And we kind of did that actually. We accidentally like started talking about it and then got caught away. So let's extend this, this show a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. No, let's extend the show a little bit and, um, let's get back into some poems, um, and, uh, okay. and talk about poetry a little bit before we, we okay. wrap up. So maybe read like a poem or two, and then we'll ask a question about a poem and then we'll, we'll, uh, do a couple more poems and then we'll be done. Okay, I'm going to read a poem called, um, from my book, called Because of You, Bearded. When we were seven, I dropped a doll from the hayloft, the porcelain girl with eyes like yesterday, and peeked through my fingers, watching her transform. The way I tore, they called it a starburst tear, if that helps. My best friend explains giving birth as a still just girl. And because of you... Bearded, it does. We pass her son between us like communion bread, and I understand this. In the multiverse of my history, you are nothing more than a deserted midnight Main Street, no real wear. Hey, why don't you do another one, too? But that's that one. That's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. There's one I want to call. Okay. Oh. There's one I thought I had, but I don't. Okay. There's one here called Bait. Here's a girl hefted onto this barbed hook of a place. Here a girl impaled on a day. Her 14-year-old face raised as if toward the sun, pink around the writhe of her eyes. An earthworm is nothing but skin in the dirt through which it tunnels, her father tells her as he baits his hook. Don't fool yourself that he could feel like you. A girl is made of skin and the air through which she moves and all the things her daddy always said. If a hook can be a home, she has been waiting long for the cold plunge of metal through her guts, has believed it will feel something like love or a man. Her penned, wriggling beneath him and his strength to provide, his calluses, his need to make nobody need. If a man can be a hook, a girl can be two homes, the dirt he holds and the dirt that buries him. 
A man is nothing but skin in the soil he calls home, her mother says, catching her glance at a man. Don't fool yourself that he can feel like you. A mother is nothing but skin and the fear through which she tunnels and the honesty to call it love. A daughter's young face raising toward a man, skin smooth in his rough light. Her daddy always said, go on girl, fish or cut bait, dinner won't wait forever. Small waves against the boat, brief pause of her held breath, brief panic of her hands, eyes, eyes. Thanks, and that was um, Bait, uh, a newer poem from Rachel Custer. Uh, Bait. Now, that's not the, the best transition, but one of the things when it comes to poetry I wanted to ask you about is um, at some point I, I saw you or, or maybe you just said um, that, that Rattle is more of a narrative poetry-based um, publication. And so certain poems sort of fit more with Rattle than other poems. And, um, you know, reading your book, rereading it again, because I read it like a year ago, but I read, read it today, I was really struck by how different your poems from The Temple She Became are from um, the poems that we've published of yours in Rattle. Um, yeah. and I, I, you know, after rereading again, um, I know exactly what you're talking about, which is your poems in that book are much more fra- fragmentary. Good. Um, they're sort of like, they feel to me like, um, yeah. viewing a scene, like, like out the car window as it drives by, like there's these like fleeting little glimpses and you don't get the whole story. Um, but you get these scenes yeah. and images and sort of the feelings of what's going on without the backstory. Um, and uh, can you talk about like that distinction for you and why, how does that happen? That you have some poems that are really sort of more narrative, I guess you could say, uh, where you have the background and know the whole story, and other poems that are these like glimpses as you sort of drive past. Uh, what does that What does that do? Yeah. Well, so that's. I'm glad that you said that because that's a very fragmented is a very very good way to describe what I meant. I I don't always know the right like the lingo. Right. Well, I'm, I'm just making it up um, as I go along. So, so I, don't, I, I have no idea either. Of, like, but. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think that's good, though, a fragmentary kind of a the little scenes, right? This this little images. Um, and I like I think that I try to do something different um, a lot because I I get bored. Um, and so I worry that um, if I'm getting bored, you know, someone else is getting, probably anybody reading is going to get bored. But also the the poems that I wrote for The Temple She Became were about some very specific, very traumatic early events. And the memory of trauma for me, I mean, the memory of trauma what, and what we know about trauma is that it's fragmented, right? It fragments. And so that was part of the form that I used and just kind of the way that those came because of the way that memory Mm -hmm. process, you know, you process those memories. Um, And then I set out to try to do some more story type poems or even poems about kind of people or personas, Mm -hmm. you know, voices. Yeah. It seems to me, um, yeah, so yeah that, it I mean, seems to me, I was thinking as we, you know, because I talked, as I mentioned before, I talked to Paul E. Nelson the other, or yesterday, about um, poetry, like as a spiritual practice for yourself, rather than poetry as a, um, you know, something for an audience to to appreciate and understand, you know. And if you're writing for this, like, pure sense of trying to understand your own world better, in, in some sense, it doesn't matter what other people get out right. of what you're writing. And rereading your book today, I kind of got the sense that that's what you were doing, right. was focusing on your own spiritual journey, yes. uh, but not even caring if other people mm-hmm. understood or got anything out of what you're writing. Um, I don't. Is that something that you think about? Do you think about the right. audience as you're writing at all? Well, I think then I didn't, right? Because that was, I mean, that book was written from over a decade, probably. Um, And I think one thing that I didn't know then, and this sounds kind of ridiculous, but until I finished, um, until I went to back to college, I didn't really realize that there was a contemporary poetry scene or genre or being (laughs) 
being written. I mean, I, I kind of thought when I was, I always wrote, I always wrote poetry. Um, but I kind of thought that you had to just be brilliant um, and then get into like the Norton anthology or something when you died. I don't know. I thought, yeah. So I, you know, I kind of just writ wrote and I took classes in when I went to college um, and realized that, you know, so then I got to read books and realize that there are people actually publishing poetry right now. But I never thought that I would be a person who could publish a book right away. Right. So I'm just writing. I was just writing out what I needed to work out at that time, which was a lot of really difficult kind of stuff that I had from my life. Uh, and, and so it was just yeah, it was just a way almost of me working that working through mm -hmm. that yeah yeah so. that makes a lot of sense that's how it felt rereading the book um do you want to close out with one last poem uh, whatever you want yes do you have a preferred um no just whatever you feel like uh, let me see I think I'll, I'll do one called God Breathed. And I, I do, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll will describe, I will say a little bit about this. Yeah, please first. do. Yeah, yeah, that please okay? do. That's a part of the fun, actually. Okay. Okay, so it's called God Breathed. And um, the reason that it's called that is because in, in scripture, in Christianity, uh, there's a concept about scripture being inspired by God. Um, and which, and the word there, the word, uh, in the original language is God means God breathed. So, um, scripture that is canon, right. Is seen as directly the breath, uh, directly born on the breath of God. Um, and that's important. I think to, it's a, it's an important thing to understand as far as my frame of mind. Uh, and then there's a Jewish rabbi who wrote uh, a quote, uh, and, and I, it's kind of a epi, what is that epigram? thing called that you put underneath the title? Yeah. Epigram. <laughs> epigram. Okay. Um, and his name is Ben Bag Bag. I think, I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry to anybody if I didn't pronounce that right. Uh, and the quote is turn it and turn it for everything is in it. Right. And it's about scripture and in how, um, if you turn it and look at it from all different ways that it's uh, everything is there. Right? So that God breathed hell, both here and anywhere, but here well, both clear and anything but clear fear, both well and desperately unwell here, both hell and hotter fires than hell hell, the smile that stays a beat too long smile, a hell that plays the heat, a song, Heat, a trial that pl that fl slays the fleet and strong. Fleet, the wind that lays the wheat oblong. Earth, the burn, the farm sun plants and skin. Hell, in turn, the harm one chants within. Farm, the land, our soiled hands call home. Soiled, the tanned and oiled lands all roam. Fall, both season and a gate to death. Death, both reason and abated breath. God both test that sends and where it sends. God both quest that ends and where it ends. And that was God breathe. Yes. God breathe. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. God yeah, breathe. Rachel Custer, yeah. oh, where, what are you doing with your poems? Are you going to put together another book? Because you have, of the poems you sent me to, to share today, most of them are not published in a book. Do you have another book uh, project coming up? Or are you just writing poems and, and emailing to people? I'm just writing poems. I mean, I'm I'm not unwilling to publish a book, um, but I the important thing to me right now is writing poems, enjoying poetry, um, sharing it with people. So you know, even with my book, I I don't char I don't like to charge. If people want it, they can. I mean, I give out free PDFs or whatever because the important thing about it is to share, right? It's the, the important thing about the art is to share it. And so, I mean, any of those, any of the poems that people are interested in them or I, I, I'm in a moment of just wanting to freely share them. I mean, I, I probably, I maybe will consider making a book 
-hmm. sometime. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I don't want to go through. I, I've been deplatformed so many times and had, you know, my first book got canceled from the first publisher. Um, and that was horrible to mm -hmm. go through. Um, and so I don't want to go through that again to where I, you know, send it out and then have someone write an email to the publisher mm -hmm. and it be pulled. It's just yeah, too yeah. gut wrenching. Well, I hear you. And so, I, I really think I tell people all the time, I think self publishing is what to do now for poetry because a small press, which is all you're going to get on anyway, can't really do much marketing and they don't really, you know, there's not, so only so much they can right. do. You kind of end up doing everything yourself. Um, even 10 years ago when my right. book came out, I made the cover. Right. I made my own little tour and stuff like that. I did all my own marketing. That was with Red Hen Press, which is a good press. Yeah. Um, and 10 years later, it's even worse than it was then. The financials just don't add up. The average poetry book sells yeah. 100 copies. Yeah. And uh, so nobody can make money off it. So they're, right. they just can't have staff um, working on your poetry books anyway, unless you end up on Norton. But if you have a poetry book that everybody loves and people buy, then you'll be end up on Norton anyway. So I right. think that um, poets should just self-publish. I don't, I don't see any reason right. to do it differently. Print on demand. Uh, make, you know, take the bigger cut of the profits and, and just if you care about your poems and your craft and edit and proofread and design covers that are really good, I think you're better off that way. I know uh, people, you know, who work at presses don't want to hear that, but I think that's just the case. It, it's an unfortunate case, but um, it's just the case now. So I hope you do that and put yeah. your, um, your books out. Cause there's a lot of people who really enjoy your, your poetry. I, I will get. I will always let people have my poetry if they want to read it. Always. Well, great. Well, thanks so much, Rachel, for joining us, and uh, hope you you know come out with another book, and, and we'll Thank have you. Thank you. Again. I appreciate you yeah, having yeah, me. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Good night. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Good night. Yeah, so that was uh, that was Rachel Custer, um, author of the book uh, "The Temple She Became" from Five Oaks Press, which you can pick up on Amazon.com still. Uh, that came out in 2017. Thanks so much to Rachel for, for being on the show tonight. Now, this is the time for the uh, prompt poems of the night as we move into the open mic portion. If you would like to join in and call, um, talk about anything, talk about what we and Rachel were talking about. I really didn't mean to talk so much about social media and uh, Rachel Custer's situation. I really wanted to focus on the poetry, but it kind of came up, and then we kept talking about it. So the show's going on longer than it normally does. Um, if you would like to join in on the open mic, though, anyway, you can give me a... Let's see, let me put this on screen. Um, uh, where's the... There you go. The phone number is 818-850-7727 if you want to share a poem or just talk about uh, what we were talking about. Feel free to give me a call. You can also send me a chat message over Skype uh, to Rattle Poetry, and I'll reply and let you know. Um, and I'll give you a call back when the time is right. Uh, if you call and I can't answer at the moment, I'll give you a call back too. So just hang out by your phone. I think that's how we usually do it. Um, now, we always have a prompt. It's a new tradition. And um, the funny thing about the prompts is that they always end up being really relevant to my and, and Megan's personal life. Uh, Megan wrote these prompts back in December when we decided to start doing this. And we're just going down in order doing them. But like we went to um, a museum in San Antonio the day it was like 3 a.m. Uh, art museum. Um, and this week we went to a, uh, uh, what's it called? The, um, you know, miniature golfing with an arcade and stuff this week, just with the kids because um, we wanted to get out. Well, we still could. And um, so we ended up in an arcade. And the prompt for this week was um, President Trump goes to the arcade. And then there was a bonus suggestion, which we're always going to do. And this is to write a villanelle, which is a specific form. It's sort of like the French sonnet, you could say. It's a 19-line poem with certain lines repeating. You'll see coming up what they're like. If you wrote one and um, didn't, didn't send it in time, but want to give me a call over Skype or the phone, uh, once again, the phone number is 818-850-7727, and uh, Skype, uh, Skype address is Rattle Poetry, all one word. You can do that right now, and I will get to you. Um, but I have a few people who sent, I think three, poem, three poets who sent poems in 
that we have. I think that's going to be the max. Like I'll pick three every week because we can't just keep going on reading poems about the same topic over and over again. But three is really fun. And then me and Megan each write a poem based on her prompts. Um, so here's my poem. Uh, so the propaganda is President Trump goes to the arcade. And the bonus section is it should be a villanelle. And this is mine. As always, I guess it's become a tradition. I wrote it. I started writing at 5 p.m. And we go on the air at 6 p.m. So I have like 45 minutes maybe to write a poem. Uh, and this is what this is my little villanelle. And I tried to... Um, you know, I should say before before I read this, I should say the the uh, opinions expressed here do not reflect those of Rattle or the Rattle Foundation. These are my own personal opinions. Although even saying that, I tried to to be um, ambiguous and I, I tried to write a poem. I thought it'd be fun to try to write a poem that either a Trump fan or a Trump uh, hater. Uh, what's the word for somebody who doesn't like Donald Trump a lot? I mean, I don't want to say like a, a rational person or something, but um, but somebody who, who doesn't like Donald Trump, a Trump opponent, could you say? Either way, I thought I'd, write, I'd try to write a poem that either one could appreciate. And uh, here's my, my little villanelle. This is when Trump visits the arcade. He always wins bigly. His scores are the best scores in whatever city. His ski ball is so pretty, so much smoother than yours. He always wins bigly. The ethics committee, those contemptible whores in whatever the city, even they must admit he wins shooter game wars, and he always wins bigly. For the kids, it's a pity, and they head for the doors in whatever the city. So don't you feel shitty as the ticket roll roars. He always wins bigly, whatever the city. So that was my oop, that was my poem. Now, um, Megan's poem, um, she always writes hers on Thursdays. And um, so we've been sitting on this for a while. This is Megan's poem. Also, President Trump visits the arcade. And um, here you go with this. And also, um, I butchered her poem so badly last time that she, uh, well, I insisted that she read it herself because I don't want to butcher everybody's poems. If you can include audio, I should say, when you submit these, if you use um, uh, openmic at rattle.com, the email address to send your poem, Send an audio file too if you use submittable um, on the open mic and you say prompt based on whatever. Include an audio file too that I don't have to butcher your poem for you and you can read it the way it should be read. Um, so anyway, here is Megan's poem. President Trump visits the arcade read by Megan. Hmm. So that's not working. I don't know why that didn't work. I guess I'm going to have to butcher Megan's poem. Anyway, I'm sorry, Megan. I don't know what happened. We recorded this and it ended up blank. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, here we go. This is... Why isn't this working? Let's see. That... Next week's prompt so is... That, that one works. So we recorded her saying next week's prompt, but her Trump poem is silent. Okay. Well, as much as I didn't want to, I'm going to have to read her Trump poem. I don't know what happened. That makes zero sense. So here is President Trump Visits the Arcade by Megan. And she's the one picking these prompts, so kind of not fair. President Trump Visits the Arcade. He likes to take war for a spin where neon lights blur every face. A bloodless kill is how you win. Put a soiled quarter in. A cartoon hero sweeps the race. He likes to take war for a spin. An inoffensive, neutered sin to gamble in this childish place. A bloodless kill is how you win. In this game, he has no skin, no risk in pixelated chase. He likes to take war for a spin. Give him tonic, hold the gin, up his sleeve a joker's ace. A bloodless kill is how you win. Losses, taken on the chin, when, he, when names are easy to erase, he likes to take war for a spin. A bloodless kill is how you win. There is Megan's poem, President Trump Visits the Arcade. We have uh, three more poems, I think, to share with you tonight. Um, who is next? This is Sean Hines, who sent a poem a couple weeks ago. So here's a new Sean Hines poem. This is uh, Sore 
loser. Hopefully the audio will work for Sean. Let's see. Hello, my name is Sean Hines. I attended Old Dominion University studying English with an emphasis in creative writing. This poem is in response to this week's prompt about President Trump going to the arcade. It is a villanelle entitled Sore Loser. That's not the high score. That's fake news. No one's ever done better than me. No one can walk a mile in my shoes. It's a hoax. It's rigged. It's all a ruse. Pac-Man, Centipede, Galaga, all three. That's not the high score. That's fake news. It didn't save my game. There must be a loose fuse. I beat the high score. They all took a knee. No one can walk a mile in my shoes. I am the president. I never lose. Don't believe what you see. That's not the high score. That's fake news. I need a new challenge. What should I choose? It doesn't really matter personally. No one can walk a mile in my shoes. The one thing I know is you may be confused. Three million more chose Crooked Hillary. But that's not the high score. That's fake news. No one can walk a mile in my shoes. And that was Sean Hines uh, reading his poem, um, Sore Loser, um, for the prompt for the week. Uh, Sean Hines was born in North Carolina and has lived most of his life in Virginia Beach, Virginia. He attended Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, studying under great artists such as Tim Siebels and Sherry Reynolds, and is currently assembling multiple collections of poetry and working on a novel. Excellent villanelle. Uh, I wonder if we should have some kind of like like who has the best, but uh, I don't want to make everything a competition, but that was a pretty good villain So thanks so much, Sean, for sharing that. Let's see. Next up we have Kathy Gibbons. Um, I'll read her bio first before she starts. Kathy Gibbons is a writer who hails from uh, Houston. She prefers roller coasters to noisy arcades. Her work, her words can be read in Baron Magazine, Poets Reading the News, Antiheroine Chic, Tuck Magazine, The Ephrastic Review, Creative Nonfiction's Tiny Truth, and Ojal, which is uh, that's the same magazine that published a bunch of Rachel Custer's poems. Um, and this is uh, her poem now. This is Blow All the Whistles, Ring All the Bells by Kathy Gibbons. Siege Machinery. Oops. This is better. Hi, Tim and fellow Rattlers. My name's Kathy Gibbons, and I'm calling in tonight from Houston, Texas. I wrote this poem in response to tonight's prompt. President Trump goes to the arcade. Here we go, and it's called Blow All the Whistles, Ring All the Bells. The bling, the bling, the bling. The throne in his brain has gone gold. There's a gleam in his eye and a sheen on his skin as he strains when he lifts his mallet and pounds it down to whack a misfortunate mole. He ejects all the pinballs and sends them to holes and sneers as the bells ring out their refrains. The bling, the bling, the bling. The banks in his brain have gone gold. No thought in his mind, no toll on his soul. A king empty, bereft, as his chaos reigns. So he heaves his mallet and pounds it down to whack a misfortunate mole. He yanks on the slot's arm to anchor his bankroll and bellows as fruits align once again. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. The banks in his brain have gone gold. At the shooting gallery, his gun has a goal in its sights, sitting ducks to shatter on aim. Then he strangles his mallet and pounds it back down to whack a misfortunate mole. This is all he has dreamed of or ever been told as he counts shiny coins and tallies his gains. The bling, the bling, the bling. The throne in his brain has gone gold. His imperial hammer is brandished once more to whack a misfortunate mole. And that was Kathy Gibbons' poem. Um, Blow all the whistles, ring all the bells. Um, you know, I found that this, was, this was a lot of fun um, to write that poem uh, two hours ago now. 
if if you um, if you're watching at home, this has been my experience reading Poets Respond um, poems submissions um, every Saturday morning for the last um, three and a half years, really more than that, four and a half years. It's just tr- Trump, Trump, Trump. Um, so I've kind of heard it all. It was kind of fun to write my own, though, for the first time. So um, it's been a fun prompt. We have one more. Um, this is Corey, Corey, Corrine O'Reilly. And uh, she didn't include audio, so I'll read it for her. Um, and the only bio I have is she lives in Southern California. This is Corrine O'Reilly. The Tower Arcade. I am the leader of the land of the free. The aides quickly nod as Melania sighed. No one wins more tickets than me. The caravan stops on the way to D.C. The beast door opens. He steps outside. I am the leader of the land of the free. His unmistakable outline against the marquee. Fake gold doors open. He looks around with pride. No one wins more tickets than me. Now zeroes in in on a game with familiar filigree. Some kids are playing. He shoves them aside. I am the leader of the land of the free. He misses all the targets. Tickets yielded three. His face is red with anger. This game is lied. No one wins more tickets than me. The manager is summoned. The game opened with a key. Trump grabs all the tickets. Pockets brimming wide. I am the leader of the land of the free. No one wins more tickets than me. Another great sound that by Corrine O'Reilly. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, now, if you uh, want to do a prompt for next week, once again, all you do is use Submittable to submit them, or you can send them by email to openmike at rattle.com. Uh, include audio if you can, that I can uh, have you read it instead of having me butcher butcher the reading. Um, but... Um, Next week's poem, next week's prompt is an addiction to soap operas. And the suggestion, which you do not have to do, but there, there'll always be a sort of a prompt to get your mind rolling and then a suggestion. And the suggestion is to have it be an epigram, just meaning short and witty. So some kind of witty short poem about an addiction to soap operas. If you want to write a longer poem, though, feel free. Uh, there's really We just want to spark... Um, writing more poems for people. Uh, and even if you don't want to submit what you wrote, just please do participate because it's so much fun. I feel like um, the whole reason that we do Rattle is because poetry is an enriching experience uh, for all our lives. We want everybody in the world to be a poet. I think the world would be, would be a much better place if everybody participated in poetry. And, you know, just, you know, we understand the world through words and through language. And if we can articulate our thoughts, um, there's really, you know, Emily Dickinson said that I know it's a poem when the top of my head is taken off. And I really believe, I've said before, but I really believe that that sense of the top of our head being taken off is um, that sort of integration of our two hemispheres, where the holistic understanding of the world maps onto our direct understanding of the world. And it's a really important thing to be doing. It makes our lives all better if we do it. So hope you do participate. Once again, uh, next week's prompt is an addiction to soap operas. And the suggestion is to make it an epigram, short and witty. So I hope you do that. Let me do one more check to make sure no one's called yet. I didn't miss any phone calls. So that is the show for the today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do click the like button. Um, share it wherever you are watching or listening to this. Uh, and click five stars. Just tell people about this show if you enjoyed it because it's a lot of fun, I think, to meet a poem in their living room every Tuesday night. I really enjoy it. You know, we publish about 300 poets a year and um, getting to see them in person is actually really fun Uh, i enjoy it i loved meeting rachel custer for the first time hope you did too and uh, we'll meet a new poet every tuesday night so click the like button click the bell subscribe give it five stars share it on facebook wherever you're watching this please do that now next week we have um lola haskins on her new book asylum which i think is from pit press although i have to look it up again um, and Lola Haskins has appeared in several issues of Rattle, and um, she's a Florida-based poet, and um, we just love Lola Haskins, so we're really looking forward to that show, and I will see you then next week. In the meantime, uh, I hope you have a good, good week and a good rest of your night, and I'll see you soon. Good night.